report enlists experts to provide Kansas farmers and ranchers with the latest information about how COVID-19 is affecting agriculture. Rural Report is a special production of Kansas Farm Bureau in partnership with KFRM's Dwayne Taves and 580 WIBW's Greg Akagi. The latest edition of Rural Report will focus on market volatility in the beef cattle market. We're joined by Dr. Daryl Peel, livestock marketing economist at Oklahoma State University. Dr. Peel, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. And we're also joined by Scott Bennett, Director of Congressional Relations at American Farm Bureau. Scott, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you all for having me. Scott, I'm going to start with you on this, and, and I want to have both of you ask, answer this question. Uh, it, it's you know, Ranchers across the country have been and seeing significant declines for market-ready animals, while the price for retail beef has soared. So, Scott, in your opinion, what has been causing this apparent discrepancy? And I guess the uh, other question to that is how long do you think it might last? Well, I'm no economist, but, uh, you know, I think – What we saw when this pandemic first began was uh, a panic by the consumer to run to the grocery store and stock up on on protein. Uh, So as you would go into the grocery store, you saw uh, you saw that there were no uh, very little protein available. Um, As economics will tell you, supply and demand really drives price. We saw the box beef cut out. Uh, soar during that time as it was an instant uh, shock to the system, Uh, as well as people panicked and went to the grocery store to buy uh, their groceries. We saw the market panic as well, and a lot of folks, without the certainty of the future, uh, those cattle futures really plummeted, uh, limit down there for for quite some time. Uh, I think it was just a simple matter of folks being in a bit of a panic, uh, we didn't see, uh, you know, how long we could be in this. So folks ran to the grocery store, stocked up on beef, uh, pork, and chicken, and and then we saw the cattle futures market plummet due to the same panic. And just your thought on how long you think uh, the situation that we're in now may last? It's hard to say exactly how long it will last. I think in many parts of the country we've seen uh, the the supply of of protein back in the grocery store. There's not a sh- uh, there never was a shortage, but there is not a, a, a need to really stockpile uh, for your family at home. Uh, how long it's going to last, that is uh, that is yet to be seen. If I had a, a, a magic eight ball, that'd be the only question I'd ask it is how long is this going to last? I do know that, you know, cattle ranchers are resilient and we will make it through this no matter how long it lasts. Dr. Peel, what are some of your thoughts? Uh, you know, Scott nailed part of it very well, I think. Uh, obviously, the consumer, the surge in consumer demand. And, and the other thing that I would take it a little bit farther, and that is in, in March when we first uh, shut down the grocery, the uh, restaurants and that whole food service side of the industry, that's basically half of our food expenditures in this country. A little bit more than half uh, typically goes through food service. And we shut that down or, or almost shut it down, greatly reduced it, and shoved all of that demand into the, the grocery store side. So those are very specialized supply chains. And in the short run, when you combine that with the surge in consumer demand at the grocery store and the fact that we couldn't reroute product uh, quickly uh, from the food service side over into the grocery store side, uh, that contributed to those, uh, you know, that situation at the grocery store. The other thing I would remind people is that this industry starts with consumer demand. I am an economist, so I'll try not to do the full lecture here, but quickly, uh, if you start with consumer demand and you back down through wholesale beef, fed cattle, feeder cattle, all the way down the chain, it's a series of what the economists call derived demands. And and the difference between one level and the next level below it is whatever takes place in that part of the marketing chain. So uh, packing, processing, transportation, all of those functions take place between the packer and and the grocery store. That contributed to that thing getting wider when we had all these bottlenecks. Uh, and at the same time, if packing plants are, are struggling uh, with the labor issues and other things, and that's kind of the current situation we're in now, uh, then uh, you know their demand for the, the inputs they use to produce meat uh, goes down. So it's very reasonable in terms of economic theory to have uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the retail level prices or the wholesale level prices go up at the same time that you have demand for the inputs going down. 
And Scott, uh, Dr. Peel mentioned the Packer industry. With the ever-changing situation that we have seen there with labor issues concerning COVID-19, and they're either maybe suspended operations or operating at reduced capacity, how much of a concern should that be for the industry? I think it is of, of dire concern for the industry. Um, we, you're exactly right. We find out every day new uh, beef or pork or poultry plants that are shutting down or running at a reduced line speed. Uh, you know, I, I, unlike Holcomb, uh, Kansas, in, in August of 2019, when uh, that plant shut down, even though it was a logistical challenge, we were able to uh, divert those cattle into other neighboring plants or run additional shifts or run on Saturday. The issue here is every plant is suffering uh, at, at least some reduced capacity because of their concern of this coronavirus or they're shut down completely. Um, it, it's, it's a very tense situation. Uh, we at American Farm Bureau are making sure uh, that the, these plants remain open because we know if they shut down, it's just a matter of time before the dominoes fall and our producers are really uh, in some economic turmoil. Dr. Peel, in a recent report, you project an estimated total loss of $13.6 billion to the beef cattle industry from COVID-19. So how much will the USDA's CARES Act program mitigate those losses and are there other steps that could be taken to help support the industry? Well, we're still waiting for a lot of details in terms of what USDA is actually going to do uh, and how they're going to implement a relief package uh, for various agricultural sectors. Given what we have heard so far, uh, in terms of the direct uh, impacts, um, you know, it looks like USDA might offset about 50, 55 percent. They're talking about $5.1 billion uh, to the beef cattle industry. And out of that $13.6 billion that we estimated, the immediate 2020 impacts were about $9.2 billion. So, so that'd be a little more than half of it. Um, and again, we know, really don't have any details yet about how that program might be implemented, how that uh, will translate into um, you know, payments for producers or, or whatever. In addition to that, USDA has said that they will be buying some commodities, including some beef, uh, for food programs. So that would provide a, a little bit of additional help for the industry. And we're joined on the latest edition of the Rural Report by Scott Bennett, Director of Congressional Relations at American Farm Bureau, and Dr. Daryl Peel, Livestock Marketing Economist at Oklahoma State University. Scott, uh, we've talked about USDA's CARES Act program, and so can you give us some insight as to how ranchers can access some of that USDA money, and what are some of the limits of that money that they're uh, hopefully going to be able to get and when producers might start seeing checks hit their bank accounts? Well, this is a critical question, uh, especially right now. Uh, as you all may know, uh, $5.1 billion uh, is, has been earmarked essentially for uh, beef cattle producers uh, or for uh, cattle uh, as a whole uh, in this initial CARES package. Um, the limit uh, across all commodities are $125,000 per entity with a $250,000 uh, cap on, on, uh, on aid in this package. Uh, as far as when folks may start seeing checks, it's preliminarily speaking with discussions at USDA. Uh, Secretary Purdue hopes to have the money uh, initially hit the bank accounts of of ranchers and, and farmers by the end of May. The one piece of advice I would give folks out there uh, that certainly are struggling and may have realized some losses is uh, please take very, uh, very detailed notes uh, and, and have all information available at hand. Uh, USDA has not released the details uh, as to how uh, people will ha apply or how much money per head or per operation they uh, could potentially get. So for now, it is imperative that people keep detailed notes so that uh, when the time comes, they'll have all the evidence necessary to prove to USDA that they, in fact, suffered a loss. One additional thing I'll mention about this initial uh, uh, CARES Act implementation is that from January 1st, 2020 through April 15th, 2020, 
Uh, this program plans to pay for 85% of the loss that uh, a producer would have received from April 15th through the end of October 2020. It will pay for 30% uh, of the loss that a producer would have received over that period of time. I'll let you answer this next, both of you answer this next question. And of the fact that we don't know when this is going to end being COVID-19 and when we can open up the economy, we also haven't implemented this uh, most recent uh, relief package from the uh, CARES Act program. Is it probable then that we will probably see or could we see another relief package after this, uh, knowing those things? And uh, let's first start with you, Dr. Peel. Well, certainly, uh, the, you know, the estimates that, that I was a part of uh, to provide input into this first uh, first phase of the, of the thing was done in the middle of, of a lot of impacts. And so uh, we noted in our report that uh, as of a certain date, this is what we project the losses to be. Obviously, we've continued to see impacts, and so there will be additional losses, and I think there's a decent chance that, uh, you know, we'll, at some point, uh, somebody will take a look at uh, how much additional impact we might see in the industry. And Scott, has there been any discussion on that in Washington, D.C.? There has. Uh, we, we feel confident that Congress will uh, address uh, a fourth phase or a fourth package of relief from this pandemic. Uh, we certainly agree with Dr. Peel that uh, $5.1 billion and, and the other allotted amounts for other commodities is not enough to make uh, producers right or at least ease the pain. We don't know the details of what that package may look like, and we don't know when, uh, but we will be working closely with members of Congress to look at that. Uh, a lot of people uh, so far have expressed their concern of the $125,000 cap uh, per commodity. There's also been some discussions about the 85% uh, loss uh, recuperation in the first quarter, and then it moves to 30% after that. You know, if we get additional money to work with, I think that could provide some flexibility for USDA to go back and look at those uh, cap limits and go back and look at that 85% uh, and 30% rate. I'm going to have you both look a little even further down the road, and Scott, I'll start with you. What does a return to normal look like for the beef industry? And to follow that, how long do you think the timeline is to get back to a stable marketplace? That's a great question. It's a hard one to answer, and it stems back to a question earlier, is how long will this last? Uh, you know, no one knows exactly how long uh, this will last. I think we still don't know the true impacts to our economy as a whole from this pandemic. I think once folks uh, are able to return back to work and return back to somewhat of a normal uh, state of life, we will then uh, begin to understand exactly what's happened uh, to our economy and what damage has been done. That will dictate certainly how people move back into, uh, into a normal life. As far as uh, the beef industry and, and what this looks like moving forward, uh, the one thing I will have to say, and this is speaking anecdotally, is a lot of people ran to the grocery store and they bought beef and they stayed at home and they cooked a steak on the grill or they made some hamburgers or a meatloaf. And I think a lot of folks really enjoyed it. And I think the, the, uh, while a lot of folks would go and get the steak at the restaurant, I think we're going to see an increased demand for that product in the household moving forward, which will be a positive thing uh, for, for the industry. Dr. Peel, your thoughts? You know, much along the same lines, I guess I would say it this way. I think uh, given the severity of what we're in right now, I, I think we're going to think about returning to normal in several phases. And Scott's already alluded to this. You know, the first phase is to get through these plant disruptions that we're suffering through right now. Industry's on pins and needles to see just how bad it could get. We're probably another two, three, four weeks to get through that and kind of get to the point where we're pretty stable in terms of processing capacity. Uh, the next phase, I think, will be then as we begin to reopen the economy, as Scott alluded to, bringing the food service sector back online. We're going to kind of see this uh, overall demand picture between uh, retail grocery and food service kind of stabilize. It's going to be a little choppy here because we've thrown a lot of ripples in this thing. Uh, so that takes a little time. And then beyond that, we have to deal with, as Scott alluded to, the, uh, the overall uh, economic 
economic impacts. We're in a recession. Uh, we haven't announced that for, you know, pronounced that officially, but there's little doubt that the U.S. economy is in a recession, but we don't really know what kind of a recession yet. So, you know, we're going to spend the second half of the year trying to see how long it's going to take to work through some of that, not just in the U.S., but really on a global basis. So, uh, so we're going to do normal in several different phases. Uh, ultimately, I think it takes, you know, several months at, at the best before we get to maybe what we're thinking of as normal, and, and maybe we never quite go back to what we had because, as Scott mentioned, we may see some permanent changes or, or some long-lived changes in, uh, in certain demand and consumption patterns. Dr. Peel, that would also entail probably amongst cattle producers having their own conversation of how can we avoid this type of an event happening. We can't avoid the pandemic because that could happen at any time, but how do we avoid what we have seen in these market prices? Well, you know, uh, I mean, the the economy and the beef industry and beef markets have, have seen enormous shocks. And, you know, I, I think this situation, more than anything, really reveals how markets deal with those shocks. And and uh, most of the things that, that look a little puzzling to people uh, really are just the market's way of dealing with these things. So we've learned kind of how to that. I think the next time it happens uh, or something like this happens, we'll have a little better a sense of it uh, as we go forward. Forward, but, uh, you know, the markets will, uh, if they're allowed to, fix these issues as quickly as possible. We'll see the volatility go down as soon as the uncertainty subsides a little bit. And we'll see, uh, you know, both cash and futures markets settle down. And, and you know, at some point, uh, maybe, you know, not too many weeks in the future, we could be back to sort of business as usual, at least in terms of sort of normal price relationships. Dr. Darrow Peel, livestock market economist at Oklahoma State University. We thank you for joining us. And Scott Bennett, Director of Congressional Relations at American Farm Bureau, thanks for joining us as well. This has been the latest on Kansas Farm Bureau's Rural Report. Our next edition of Rural Report, Dwayne Taves will be discussing the food supply chain with Doug Baker of FMI, the Food Industry Association, and Purdue University Distinguished Professor and Ag Econ Department Head Jason Lusk. Thank you for joining us.